Tick timer. Man, and so I was telling Mitch before the show that uh, Google Chrome is doing some weird stuff. It, uh, it's a great tool, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's a great tool when it works, but sometimes it has its own mind. And uh, if any of you guys know about uh, GPU acceleration inside of Chrome, uh, let me know because it's it's causing me havoc left and right. Real fun stuff. Love it immensely. And on that note, I believe it's probably time to start the show in five, four, three, two. Hello and welcome back to another frustrating episode of TSLR <laughs> Film New Podcast where I continue to deal with my technical difficulties and I've got Mitch here with me today to enjoy the hassle together. Mitch, what have you been up to, man? <laughs> Sounds like a cat. That's not a sound effect. That's my cat. He's over here bugging me. I'm having all sorts of great fun, DJ. I got to go see um, my good friend Pamela Ann Barry from... Atomos. She's working at Atomos now. Oh, wow. Back in the day when we used to do a Planet 5D podcast, which has gone on and then off and then on and off again, um, she was one of my co-hosts. So she was in town doing a little presentation for Atomos. And no, they're not a sponsor of mine, but got to give them a bell ring anyway. Uh, but it was good to see her. She's touring the country, teaching people about Atomos. It's cool stuff. Those uh, their screens have gotten really, really good. I've I've yeah. started to to love their screens. I would just wish they would do something with the freaking battery because you know the battery life is is not that long and it's huge. You got this big of a thing hanging off this cute tiny screen and it just <laughs> it doesn't make it as ergonomic as you think it would be. And their screens are so beautiful. I mean, I would say they're as good as any of their com competition out there. But on my end. I have been running ragged, uh, flying about, uh, filming uh, an industrial set of videos to promote women in trade. So that has uh, been my job for the last uh, week and a half or so. And if you look behind me, I'm going to switch cameras and you can see the mess that this has created in my studio. See this table full of junk? I just unloaded my bags from my trip and <laughs> oh my God. I got to sort through some stuff. It's a... Uh, it's a horrible mess back there. I am afraid to dig into it. I don't even. I couldn't even find my memory card holder, and uh, that's got all my footage for editing this weekend. Uh -huh. So, whew, man, don't do what I do and just dump your bag out on a table and hope for the best. No, <laughs> that's really bad. Yeah, I got new glasses this week. Woohoo! Oh yeah, the world's crystal clear now. Yeah, for a minute. Unfortunately, these are computer-only glasses, so as soon as I walk away from my computer, I can't see again. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. So, uh, what, do they have some kind of special film or something on them? Or? Oh, no, 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 no. They're just designed uh, to be this distance, you know, where my computer is focused uh, and everything else is blurry. And I, I actually have another pair, which is in the other room, that I use for everything else. So, even. <laughs> You know, when you get old, DJ, it's hell. It's, it's real hell because then, I mean, because if I use the everyday glasses, then I, as I stand at the computer, I can't really see and I'm standing back trying to get focus. And Isn't that what trifocals or, or bifocals are for? Those are a pain in the butt because too, because you, with tri, especially trifocals, you only get a tiny little narrow slot to look through. Bifocals have a, just a bigger slot, which is what my other glasses actually are. But it's really nice to have a, I mean, you're staying, I'm, I'm in front of a computer for 12 hours a day, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's much nicer to have one pair of glasses that just sees everything clearly. And it's really nice. Anyway. Okay. I, I couldn't find my glasses this morning. So I am, if you see me squinting like this to try and read my screen, that's uh that's what's going on for me. So. On that note, I think it's probably time for the news. Time for the news. Time for the news. Time for the news. First thing on the list here is actually a, a pretty interesting uh, controller hack. And if you're an editor, you're always searching, searching for different ways to cut your footage, to control your footage while you're in your NLE. And this gentleman here has created a controller 
uh, interface for his NLE where he uses basically a game controller to run cuts, plays, scrubs, and all the other things that you would want out of your NLE. And I can actually even play some video footage here of how that's working. He's scrubbing through the footage using the nubs and he's stopping play, starting play, doing ripple cuts and so on. It's a really interesting method for editing. Mitch, would you use something like this? And do you think a game controllers is, are the right form factor for editors? Well, I, I watched that video and let me tell you, that was dang impressive. Uh, he has got keys or controller functions for absolutely positively just about everything you can think of in terms of an of an editor tool, an NLE. Uh, stunning, really stunning. The hard part is training yourself to use it, right? Yeah, you have to memorize all those buttons. I suppose you could use uh, uh, sticky labels or something like that to put the information on the keys themselves. Uh, one other way to do this, and I've seen a few people do it in the past, is they've actually programmed a 10-key style numeric keyboard uh, to do the same thing. And if you use one of these right here, your space bar is actually already set up for you. Uh, the space bar is off to the to the right here. And with that space bar, you can start and stop play. And then you program your function buttons to your numeric keypad and you can control scrub and so on. I like the controller just because it's a, it's a really different way of doing it. But uh, if you want something a little more traditional, having a number pad off to the side of your keyboard is a convenient way to go. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I have to laugh, PJ, uh, because for us old timers, again, I'm dating myself, but uh, numeric keypads were the standard on a keyboard for since forever. I mean, every key, I'm, my keyboard that I have right now, which I can't hold up because I got too many cords, has a numeric keyboard on it. And it's shocking. I know I, I have to actually specify something different when I do an order because the standard keyboard that they now have doesn't have the keypad. I use <laughs> that constantly. Now, maybe it's different in the PC world, but on, in the Mac world, every keyboard doesn't have a numeric keypad. I don't know why people don't use the thing. I mean, you use it constantly. Well, I'm actually an old school keyboard user. So if you want to, I'm going to out myself here. Look at this monstrosity yeah. that I use. This is go. an IBM Model M keyboard, and uh, it has the clicky keys. You can hear those clicking. They're super loud, but it's uh, it's a gorgeous. Well, <laughs> dropping cameras. It's a it's a gorgeous keyboard, and it does in fact have a ten key on it. Um, I I'm not as good with the ten key as some other people I know, but I've seen the masters of the ten key where they're just like one handed doing uh -huh. math and doing spreadsheets and stuff like that. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, mine is not programmed for anything in particular. I just memorize my shortcuts in Premiere. But it is interesting that you could use some of these controllers. And I think either memorizing shortcuts or doing something like that game controller, whatever works for you to, to speed up your editing. And that kind of brings me into the shortcuts. Uh, Mitch and I have talked about this before. Each of us use our own little scripts and so on to kind of speed things up or we keep text files with uh, things that we write on a regular basis that we can copy and paste. Mitch, what are some things that you shortcut in order to make your life easier? Everything. <laughs> uh, ab absolutely everything. Um, I mean, it's just about everything that I type on a regular, any kind of a regular basis, I have keyboard shortcuts for. Um, I even have keyboard shortcuts, for example, for the sound effects, right? Now, I know you have a separate controller for doing all that. Uh, mine is software-based, so so I'm, I just assign keystrokes to doing things like uh, those sound effects. Again, it's hard sometimes to necessarily remember all of those different keyboard shortcuts. But I have a program called Typinator, right? And, and there are different programs on PC to do that. So guess what? I type 5D Mark III 6 billion times in my life, right? <laughs> uh, 
instead of typing 5D Mark III when I'm writing a blog post, I just simply type 5D3, and it replaces 5D3 with the entire Canon EOS 5D Mark III string. So I, I type three characters, and then I get, was that, six words, practically. Uh, I do that with standard emails. You and I probably get lots of emails that people ask questions. They have a problem with something. They, they hate my pop-up, you know, that comes up to say, hey, you know, sign up for our newsletter. So I actually have a three-letter keystroke that types an entire letter that says, hey, I'm sorry you didn't like the pop-up. Pop-ups are really nice, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're really helpful. So I don't have to type all those things all the time. Now, programmers do that a lot for what they call snippets, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I just can't tell. The other thing that I do have is a keyboard macro program. So there are some things that aren't just text, right? They are functions that you normally would, uh, you know, open a browser page and go to planet5d.com and, you know, click somewhere on the page to do something. Well, if you do that more than twice, then you ought to have a, some sort of a macro to make that happen. And I, so, you know, I have things that open pages. I have things that make sounds. I, I you know, I, I use a CRM, a uh, um, customer relationship management program called Close. There's another plug for you. And that's C-L-O-Z-E which I use to process my mail and to keep relationships and keep information about what's going on in the world. Uh, and so I have several keyboard commands to open that. Um, and, it's, and it's a browser-based program, right? So if you go to close.com and you log in, it also has a phone app. But I get really frustrated with, uh, and I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this. I know it, there are also... Um, PC applications for this. But so if you're using a website like Close, for example, and you use it inside your browser like Chrome or Safari, then you've got a window open, right? But if you specifically are, are let's say Gmail, right? And, and, and so you have to find the window or tab where you have Gmail open. And what I do is I have a program that's called Fluid on the Mac, which is a Safari emulator, and it will allow you to run a website as a standalone application. And so, I mean, it's like, you know, like your mail program or, um, or Excel or whatever. Those are all standalone apps, right? So you can get to them quickly with keyboard commands and you're kind of, frowning at me like <laughs> no i was just thinking about like uh, what, what's the practical benefit to having that is it a shortcut assignment as opposed to being inside of the browser well I, the biggest deal is how many windows you have a you have chrome open right now right oh yeah how many windows and tabs do you have open in in chrome okay well i'm looking right now and i have well, let me see if i can share my screen here so you guys can see what kind of mess i've got going on this this screen is has got everything on it, and uh, you can see right now that I've got whoa uh, man I got a lot of stuff up. I've got probably six tabs in Chrome, another three tabs in Internet Explorer. I've got five or so file windows open. Plus I've got uh, the show notes that we're looking at. So I have a mess of stuff open, but I have so, a huge so screen like, too. So you have. Right. But let's suppose that you have uh, Gmail in one of those tabs, but you quickly want to go open your mail, right? You want to okay. do it. You, if, if you're a normal user, you grab your mouse and you go over and you, op you find Chrome, and then you have to navigate through multiple tabs in order to find your Gmail application, right? If, you're, if you take that and make it a standalone application, then, of course, you can do Alt-Tab, right, to navigate yep. to open apps. And then it's right there in front of your face, as opposed to having to go th hunt through a whole bunch of different tabs and windows within Chrome to, make, to find it. 
Now I actually have a keyboard shortcut that I just, which will open my standalone application if it's not open, go over to my close, which is, it's funny to say, cause I, I'm opening close, right? <laughs> close, so close. So it has a mail function in it and a calendar function and all these other tools. So I have a keyboard shortcut. So I want to find, say, I know you sent me an email. So I have a keyboard shortcut that opens close, goes to the people finder and puts my cursor right there in the field where I can start typing a name, which also slays me, by the way. I can't tell you how many applications or windows you go to. And I'm going on a deep rant here. <laughs> Uh, so you see, so you go to, uh, I don't know, Google, for example, you open a tab for Google or Amazon's the perfect one for this. And your cursor is not sitting in the search field. I do not understand why programmers do not put the cursor in the search field so that if I go to Amazon, I can just start typing. I have to grab my mouse and physically <laughs> click in that stupid search field when they know that's what I'm going to do, right? Even that's poor I, design. That's super poor I'm design. Somewhere else, put the cursor in the search field. So what I end up doing is creating keyboard shortcuts <laughs> to open that window and physically click in that place so I don't have to do that, grab that mouse and move the cursor there. Now you mentioned you know, text I'm insane, but that's what I do. You mentioned like autofill and stuff. Uh, uh, I use personally Grammarly uh, for my autofill and it works similar to what you have on your phone. When you start typing something, it just finishes the word for you. Is there a Mac version of Grammarly? I know Grammarly is both PC based and web based. So I can use it either on my machine in Microsoft office if I'm working in office or I can use it on my browser. Do you have something like that as well? I mean, that's, that's what Typeinator is for me. Right? Okay. I mean, so. and, and, and it, it corrects misspellings. So it has a whole database full of common misspellings. And I know Apple's got some of that stuff in, in the operating system, but you can create shortcuts and, and, and so it's a, it's a program you have to pay for. And I always pay for the upgrades, which come around every year. And I know Grammarly is not free, right? No, it's $99 a year, but it's right. totally worth it. And, uh, okay, this is getting super off topic, and then we're going to jump away from this right after this. But <laughs> one of the cool things that Grammarly does is once a month it sends me an email to let me know how many words I type a month, and it tells me what words and what spelling issues or grammar problems I have and I need to work on. And so for me personally, it's, it's commas. I don't use commas enough or in the correct manner, and it always takes care of that for me. But I didn't realize it until I started using Grammarly that I type – in the fifteen to 20,000 words uh, a month range or more. And I would have had no idea if I hadn't started using Grammarly. So it's kind of interesting to keep track of your stats as far as how much you write and how much you type and, and what you're creating. Uh, yep. It's also fun to find the word that's like tripped you up so many times. And for me, it was, uh, I think I was spelling a word with the I in the wrong spot and the E in the wrong spot every single time and like consistently. So it had 57 or 87 errors on, I think the word frequency or something like that. So really strange, really fun. All right. That's enough about our typing loves and hates and our computers. Let's talk about this bundle that you put in the show notes, Mitch. Uh, you're starting to do a sort of like a bundled thing. Tell me more about it. Um, there's a, a company called The Five Day Deal, and they have been around for probably, I think, three years in the photography world. Okay. Where you can go find, buy their five day deal. So it only lives for five days. And they bundle together a whole bunch of different products and sell it to you very inexpensively. Uh, in the photography world, they're, they're selling hundreds of thousands of copies of this because people really like to get. <laughs> A bargain, right? So this, what I did was I worked with the Five Day Deal team and helped them put together the very first video version, which is called the Complete Video Creators Bundle. And this is the first time we've ever done, they've ever done, I shouldn't say we, because I'm not part of the team. But so they have put together this bundle and, 
and if you're watching live, DJ is showing the uh, the product list that I grabbed, which is the first two, four, six, eight, ten products. There's twenty something products in the bundle, and the price is ninety seven dollars. Now that sounds initially a little steep, but if you look at the list, the very first product in there is the introduction to cinematography by Shane Hurlbut, a huge name in the filmmaking. Hollywood filmmaking world. Everybody knows Shane, or at least in DSLR video and stuff. And that product's $445. So if that's the only thing you wanted to get, it's on sale from $445 now to 97 So you buy it for that one product alone, save, what is that? I don't know, 75 about, Yeah, exactly. About $345. And, and then you get uh, Mark Wonderland's Business Films Blueprint. So if you want to improve the way your business is running, you get his product. There's some DSLR video training from Dave and Barry Anderson, you know, my good buddy Barry Anderson, who wrote, I can't reach it, the DSLR Filmmaker's Handbook, which is behind me over here. So you get uh, five hours of his training. Um, getting started with Final Cut Pro, Video Rockstar. Shane, Cher Ross is a gal that I've met recently who is in a band called Vixen. I don't know if you, you probably, maybe you remember them. Maybe you don't. No, Mark, you're not. Mark, it's not striking a bell. They're from the eight. Well, DJ. They're from the <laughs> 80s, right? They're from, they're, so, but they were an all-girl heavy metal rock band called Vixen. Anyway, she's now doing training and she's got a really nice video uh in in this bundle about what you and i do and that's get in front of a camera right you and i do it most filmmakers quote unquote don't do it but guess what i mean why why would a filmmaker want to learn to be comfortable in front of a camera well promotion obviously when you have to do a lot of promotion i i have to do public lectures all the time whenever I run a feature length film around. So, you know, you go to the conventions, you have to stand in front of a camera and talk about your stuff. You have to do interviews. You have to be able to articulate what your film's about in a really short snippet that they can turn into a news bit. And I mean, it's completely necessary for people to be able to talk out loud. Exactly. And so her product called Video Rockstar University is $149 normally. So if you only wanted that one product, you can still save 50%. And, and I could go on. There's, there are 20 products in here. There's um, color grading software. There's some uh, uh, film grains. If, you wanna, if you're into film grains, you can get into that film grain stuff. Uh, it's insane. There is so much stuff in here, and it's only $97. But it ends next Tuesday. So if you're watching this podcast or listening to it, after May 24th at noon Pacific time, sorry, I've just gotten you all excited and it's over. And they're, they're never going to offer this bundle again. And it's, I mean, it's not like, I've, I've seen a lot of things where they say, well, we're never going to do this again. And then six months later, you see it and it's cheaper. They do not do these bundles again. These products will never be in another bundle from them. And so if you want to get it, you have to get it before May 24th at noon. And if you go to planet5d.com slash bundle, pretty simple, planet5d.com slash bundle, you can pick that sucker up for $97. I'll have a link to that in the show notes, guys, too. So if you are not able to remember that little snippet there, you will be able to go straight to the show notes and check that out. And apparently there's some music also playing in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, they got an autoplay. And by the way, 10% goes to charity. Oh, wow. They so it's sort of like a humble indie bundle type of deal. Yeah, yeah. So so ten percent goes to charity. They've raised in the in less than twenty four hours. They've already raised almost ten thousand dollars for charity. So that's awesome stuff. Great, go check that out, guys. Next up on the list here is actually a really oddball item that Devin sent me, and this is a, a lens uh, filter cover for the extremely wide uh, Olympus. 
7 to 14 millimeter f2.8 lens. Uh, if you're familiar with that, the front element is quite bulbous. And uh, with yeah. this adapter, uh, you're able to sort of circumvent that problem by gripping onto the outside and creating a filter that goes clear over the top of this. Now, if you've seen that lens before, you also know that it does not have the traditional little tray at the back of the wide angle lens for filters. So you still can't use a uh, a variable ND filter on this because remember guys, wide angle and variable ND, they don't mix. You'll get mm -hmm. weird kind of crosshatch patterns because the angle of reflection through the light is, or through the lens is not correctly straight for that thing to work. But you can use different color filters. You can use uh, a plain old ND filter and a few other things as well in order to uh, get filters onto your wide angle lens. Now, Mitch, do you shoot any wide angle stuff and would you use a filter? Well, let me back up a second. I don't think I've ever heard anybody tell me that before about wide angle. Cross hatching? Yeah. Okay, so one of the issues is actually, the, if you think about the way a variable ND filter works, it is two polarizing filters that are moved uh, back and forth across each other. And as the cross hatching of the light is changed, it darkens or lightens based on how those two interact. But the right. problem is it interacts at a straight light in sort of manner. So with an ultra wide angle lens, as soon as you get off axis far enough, suddenly it changes the amount of light that's coming in. And the further off axis you get, the less the N, the variable ND will affect the light coming through it. So oh. you'll get brighter sides on one portion and you'll get darker sides in another portion. And that changes as you go around the spherical view of the lens itself. So if you have an ultra wide angle lens and you try to put a variable ND filter on it, you'll get some really weird results because of that effect. I'll be damned, I've never heard that. Does that make sense though? I mean, yeah. you think about polarizing and it's simply the angle at which the two elements interact with each other. So it's, what yeah, it's a... Where, where does that approximately start in terms of... If you try to slap something on say the 16 to 35 millimeter uh, Canon uh, L series lens, I would say about 20-ish tw uh, to 16-ish is where the effect is really predominant. You can oh. kind of get away from it at 35 and at 24, but uh, below that on really wide angle lens, especially fish eyes, you'll, you'll really start to see that effect. And uh, you can do, that's why they have the filter tray on the back of a, uh, a 16 to 35 or some of the other wide angle lenses. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, Mitch. On the very back of the lens, there's a little tray. No. <clears throat> see, I'm learning all sorts of stuff today. Oh man, I just happen to have one right here handy. Wow. So if you look at the back of this right here, you'll see that there's actually this little square trough right here. And you, know, you can see that, guys, for those who are watching the video. This trough actually allows you to slide a filter into the back of your wide-angle lens. And with that filter, you're able to you know, put an ND on your lens or a colorization or any of the other things that you would want to put on the back of a lens in order to filter it. Uh, that way you're not getting that effect because the light passes straight through on the back, but it does not pass straight through on the front element. Oh. And as the light comes in from the side, it will negate some of the effects that you would normally get out of a variable ND filter. So if you want to use a filter on a wide angle lens, open up your camera lens and take a look at it and see if it has that tray on the back. They even, Canon's kind enough usually to put a little uh, pattern on the back too so you can use that little square pattern to measure and cut out your filter from a gel or what have you and then slide it into place wow god i didn't i had no clue dj you are amazing it's one of the secrets like i there's so many things like that that you think everybody knows so you never talk about and then it comes up in random conversation and you're they're like what Is, that's a thing yeah oh apparently i know something <laughs> Yeah, you do. You, I say it all the time. You know some stuff. So this Taiwan Taiwan thing that we were talking about, the screw-in filter holder, that actually in the picture is going over the lens hood. Goes, so you could have a lens hood and have the filter on the outside of that. That's pretty bizarre. Yeah, it's a... Uh... I, I'm trying to show the actual site, but now I have to accept some sort of agreement for what is going on with Canon rumors today. 
Well, that's not Canon Rumors. Or, uh, um, I don't even know what's going on that's with my web browser. Rumors.com. I always get those mixed up. Doesn't isn't that all owned by the same individual? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Canon Rumors is owned by my good buddy Craig, uh, and Four Thirds Rumors, Sony Alpha Rumors, Fuji Rumors, Canon Watch is all owned by Vitaly from Russia. So ah. And and if you look at the top of the page at four, any of those sites, you can see links to all of those other ones and and. But no, Canon Rumors is is stands alone and is. I won't. I, he's a good friend of mine, so I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Any, anyway, this yeah. is a. It, it does go over the element itself. Um, it goes over the lens hood because the lens hood is built into the lens itself. Uh, yeah, you can't take those off. They're permanently attached. It's the same thing, and I've got a smaller version here. The Olympus eight millimeter. The lens hood is actually built into the lens itself, so their caps are extra cover thick and go over the top and clip right on. Cover your butt so that you don't scratch the surface. I see. Good for them. Yeah, and I mean, when you get to to a wide angle on an M43 body, you really do have to kind of go fisheye in order to accomplish that wide angle because you need a double or half of the millimeter size for what you're trying to accomplish. So 16 to get that same field of view, you need an eight millimeter lens. And I, that's pretty, pretty bulbous uh, as far as the glass element goes. Now, yeah. moving on down the line here, let's take a look at this monitor. I kind of mentioned this at NAB, but then I sort of forgot about it. And now it's starting to pop up. This is the Feel World G55 and G70 series monitors. These are made out of machined aluminum. They're a 1080p IPS display that looks very crisp and clear. And uh, they also have the ability to run a tally light off of the USB port. The cool thing about this is two things, actually. One is you can kind of see commerce in motion with this. Um, looking on uh, b &H and some of the other suppliers, you can find this monitor for around $700. But I was talking to Mitch before the show. Mitch, what do you know about Alibaba? I, I know... I've heard the the phrase uh, Alibaba is a genie or something from the old stories. And... I mean, uh, you're moving in the wrong direction here, so I'm going to pick up where you left <laughs> off. Uh, Alibaba is a marketing site for uh, Chinese products, and and uh, basically a lot of the uh, companies in like Shenzhen and so on that make screens, they make uh, little bits and pieces, they make uh, cups, glasses, anything you can think of, really. Uh, it, they make those and then they try to find a market for them. So if you go to Alibaba.com right now uh, and take a look, you can actually find uh, this monitor in bulk pricing for as low as $480. And you wow. can see they tell you like a minimum order. You have to buy a minimum of five pieces to get whatever price they're asking for. Or you have to buy a minimum, if you want one piece, you have to pay a premium for it and so on. So. This is really designed for people to buy a whole bulk thing of whatever and then bring it back to the United States and sell it. And you can negotiate with these guys based on the order number and the the uh, uh, amount that you're spending with them in order to get discounted pricing and stuff. This seems like a, the perfect opportunity for some kind of um, Groupon or something of that nature for people to jump on for monitors because at 740 for this monitor versus... 480 for this monitor if you could get you know 15 or 20 people together to buy the monitor at the same time that would give you a very significant discount on what would otherwise be a kind of expensive spendy monitor and you go to b and h and i've got the links in the show notes and i've got the Al alibaba links in the show notes but you can see that the b and h says it's a delayed order so if you order it from b and h it could take up to a month for it to get to you and why does it take up to a month? Well, uh, it might be coming from uh, the same manufacturer. Yeah. I, I'm not going to put that on anybody's head in particular, but uh, you know, it makes sense. They have to deal with the middleman stuff, so then they mark it up a couple hundred dollars, and bam, it makes its way on to you. Mitch, now that you know about this, are you huh. going to start marketing a Planet D branded monitor or battery or a cup of any kind? 
hell, Planet Planet Five D branded anything? No, we'll just we'll just bun, buy in bundles and uh, and sell them and and take the profit ourselves. Well, there was uh, Devin and I were at NAB this year, and we were looking around, and this guy ran up to us, and he's like, "I'll sell you batteries," and we were kind of confused at first. We didn't understand. Uh, what he was talking about and it turns out he was wanting us to to buy batteries in bulk from him and then put dslr film noob labels on them and mark them up and sell them in the united states and i i don't feel comfortable doing something like that particularly but it's interesting because then Devin's like well haven't you seen so-and-so's battery and I'm like, oh, well, no, I haven't. He's like, well, look at this. And he brings up a picture of it on his phone. And it's the exact same battery with a new sticker on it that's like got the guy's name on it. It's like so-and-so's professional brand batteries, the only batteries I use. And they're the same. Really? Yeah. And I'm not going to say the guy's name. I'm not outing anybody on the show. But that was <laughs> literally the battery was here. And it was just a generic uh, Shenzhen made battery. And then the other battery was like, change the label out, put the new label on. Bam, I got you covered, buddy. Well, that's, it's interesting. I mean, there there's some money to be made there, obviously. And there's issues, of course, with overhead and shipping and all, you know, all that other crap that you don't want to deal with. I actually had an opportunity five, six years ago now with those uh, cups, the lens, you know, that look like a Canon lens that yeah. are a coffee mug. Yeah, I, got, got a novelty I, one laying around somewhere. I almost went in with somebody on a deal to buy a couple of thousand of those and sell them online. And I probably <laughs> could have done it because you see those things everywhere. Uh, probably could have made a mint and been retired sitting on a beach somewhere. I don't know. But, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a scary thing to, to go into that kind of a business because you don't know how many you're going to sell. And if you can, you know, at least like this, bundle them, say, hey, DSLR film noob peeps, we're going to go together. If we can get 10 of you guys to buy these, we'll get this price. And, you know, that might be kind of an interesting project, but. There's now, one of the things I do actually use Alibaba for on a regular basis is uh, promotional materials. So if I need to churn out a couple hundred copies of something with really? like a DVD in it or something like that, I already have my graphics design artist created, you know, everything, all my layouts, all the stuff, but I need a printing company or I need someone to package things or what have you. And you can go to Alibaba and you can find a paper manufacturer that does printing and work and negotiate with them to get you know a couple hundred of whatever packet done and a lot of times i don't like not buying american if i can help it but sometimes it's half the price or a quarter of the price and i mean the promotional materials are basically giveaways for me i'm handing them out to people hoping that they will uh, invest in our next feature film or whatever and being able to create those for as cheaply as possible yeah. is beneficial to me so I go over there, I negotiate with these guys, you send them emails, uh, sometimes you have to use uh, Google Translate to figure out what the heck they're saying, <laughs> but uh, you can usually work something out and uh, have your products in a uh, month to two months. Uh, do be careful though, uh, Chinese New Year is like a month long, and if you try to order something during that time, they may negotiate with you for price and take your money, but they won't even get started on it until they're back from vacation. So no. uh, one of the red flags to watch out for. Now, the other thing is if you ever do any vending, um, you run a booth or something like that, you can get anything with your name on it. If you ever go to, well, at any B example, you see the keychains and the laser engraved, uh, you know, bottle openers and the, yeah. the wood yeah. made whatevers, all those things available on Alibaba with whatever name you want stamped on it, you know, in East Why didn't why didn't you tell me this before? Because I was wanting to do that at NAB this year and I found the, the pricing was just way too high. You never told me, Mitch. I'm sorry. We just I mean if you, the question is never asked, <laughs> how can I possibly know to answer it? Yeah, well, because I didn't have any clue that you A knew this stuff and B had all these awesome resources. I mean this is a this episode is just incredible. If you, uh, one of the things, money all over the place. One of the things that you can do with this too is if manufacturing, if you have an idea for a product, 
uh, you can go to some of these um, uh, printing companies and some of these uh, industrial CNC machine companies, and you, if you have the design already made up in the layouts or the molds or whatever, you can go to them and negotiate bulk pricing for production of said item, and you can get it down to... I was I almost went into mass production of the DSLR film noob uh, shock mount that I print myself and sell, uh, mm -hmm. and that would have cost it would it would have dropped the cost for me from a, a few bucks down to pennies if huh. I were willing to do that. And you know you have to go through the process of the molds and then right. the proofs and everything else, and it probably would have taken a flight to to China, which by the time you do all that, it's probably not worth it. But if you have something really cool that everybody really wants something like that could be you know your next step to entrepreneurship and if you look on kickstarter or any of these other uh platforms for you're starting a product basically they prototype it and then they link up with one of these companies to try and build it or multiple companies to get the motors to get the wiring to get the electronic boards to get the mold injections and so on all to put together into one shop and you can find a lot of this stuff and get it started on Alibaba wow. and Baidu, of course. Uh, Baidu is their sister company that does more of the manufacturing side of stuff. Well, oh, of course. How do you <laughs> say that? Baidu? Baidu. Baidu and Alibaba are the two that you want to check out. That I've done manufacturing before, so I, I know a lot about this. It's something that a lot of people don't know about. So, you know, having the information hopefully will help some of you if you have a crazy idea for a rig, an armature, or anything else. I love to see wacky camera products go out the door. So, well, I I think the show's over now. I'm gonna go spend the rest of the time surfing. <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of crap on this website. It's it's, it's anything, man. Uh, one of my friends sells the the popcorn, the like kettle corn popcorn, and right. he's like, I want some branded um like uh, glass mugs that you know that look like the uh, the mason jars. He's like, but they charge like 15 bucks for him, and I can't make any money on this. I'm like, check on Alibaba. And sure enough, he was able to find like full-size ones where they would engrave his, his company's name on the front of them and charge him like $3 a pop. And now suddenly it's worthwhile for him to buy a 1000 at a time and then sell them, and he can get 15 bucks out of them. I mean, he's not getting rich off of it, but that's way better than paying retail price for it, and it's got his name engraved on it. What? Three dollars a pop. That was a good pun. I know you didn't plan that, but get it. <laughs> Popcorn, pop, three. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, I got it. This okay. Is awesome. All right. Show's over. Oh, wait. No, we got a few more things to go. <laughs> uh, speaking of Kickstarters, let's talk about some headphones here. Uh, this came from uh, Planet 5D, a la the Kickstarter page. This is the Noel CH 1 earbuds. And. Mm -hmm. You did the same thing that I did. I'm I'm interrupting you, and I apologize. Did I mispronounce it? Have no, they have screwed up the name completely, and I really wish they had done something differently. I said I would the first time I saw it, I was like, I mean, uh, how do I? Pr what is this? Is this Noel? Is it No Wall? Is it No Wall? Turns out it's No Wall. No right. Wall. Okay. Right. I mean, they're basically, they're, it's it's a Bluetooth thing that they think they've got a chip that will, you know you can walk around and I you know. So it's like no barriers, basically. They're saying no no, no wall can stop you. I which I have yet to really find out for sure because uh, I, all right. So let's back up. I'm getting way ahead of the story. So uh, to a friend of mine, uh, David Dispanet, got involved with this company and so this is in kickstarter right now uh, they are producing in-ear earphones that are astounding i mean i actually have a pair if you're watching on on the tubes um i have a prototype pair so there's there's the earbuds okay um, and then there's a little dangly bit which has the um the Bluetooth transmitter and Bluetooth. receiver. Right. Now, normally, if you, my daughter and I have looked for Bluetooth headphones, and normally what I didn't know is it's, I always thought, well, if you're going to do Bluetooth, why, why is there a cord between them, right? Um, well, because you have to get audio to both left and right ear. 
But couldn't you have an earbud that had the uh, uh, Bluetooth in it without a cord between the two? You and could, but out, that gets really wacky. It turns out it's very difficult, right? Nobody's yeah. doing it, <laughs> which I didn't know. I was always like, I just want one earbud. I want, two, I want no wires. Anyway, it's really hard to do. Uh, but anyway, these guys, so they shipped me a pair. They said, you know, you're a friend of ours. Would you be interested in trying a pair out? I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of like you. I don't normally like in-ear headphones because you can't really hear well unless you get a good seal, right? You, and I, don't, I don't know if you've ever tried them really. I mean, there's lots of them and you get them partially in your ear and you're like, it sounds rather tinny. I personally can't stand having something jammed into my earlobes. And so looking at those in, in every in-ear earbud, it's like I've never even bothered testing the quality of them because it just is uncomfortable for me to walk around with something jammed in my ear like that. Right. And it, in fact, because of that, I'm a little ridiculous. Here are my <laughs> Bluetooth headphones. And uh, these are the Sennheiser Momentous, uh, I think, uh, version two or what have you. And they're noise canceling, they're Bluetooth, and they are wired. So you can actually plug these directly in as well. So they serve like every purpose possible. But yours are adorable and cute. And these, you know, <laughs> I look like a ridiculous fool walking around with them. But I don't care because style is not my thing. Now, continue. Tell me more about these. Well, it, it, every in-ear headphone that I've ever tried is a pain in the butt because because you really have to get a good good seal otherwise you can't hear the bass it just sounds like treble and the iPhone headphones actually sit outside of your ear even though they sit you know in I don't know what the technical term is I mean they they, they go into your ear yeah but they don't go all the way down into your canal right so I don't know what the right words are. I'm not a headphone. <laughs> That's okay. I don't know but, either. But but it, you got good sound out of those because they're right next to your ear and it can, the sound goes down there and you can get good bass out of those. But if, if you're actually using the ones that go into your ear canal, uh, you've got to get a really good seal. And, and I first didn't actually like these either because the little rubber tips that they give you just weren't working for me. And then I realized that they sent me a pair of these uh, memory foam. They're, I don't know if they're actually memory foam, but they're foamy. And it, it, you can't really tell when I hold this up to the... So is it more of like a earplug style uh, yeah. of you, where you can kind of push on it and it collapses and then it expands again? Yeah. So it expands in your ear and, and the sound out of these things, I currently have on my Bose QC3s or QC 15s, I've forgotten. My daughter has one and I have the other, 15s or 3s, whatever, which are the noise canceling, which is active noise canceling as opposed to passive, which, you know, these kinds of things are passive because they're just blocking your ear canal. They're not yep. actively listening to the outside surroundings and trying to cancel. Uh, but, so I had the old, the, the first set of rubber tips that they sent and I'm like, these sound like crap. I'm really disappointed because their their retail price is going to be a hundred dollars. I'm like, I'm not going to spend a hundred dollars on these. And then I put the memory foam, the foamy ones on, and I went, holy crap! And now I can hear because it did the right thing that it needs to do to expand inside my ear to make the right blockage. Uh, so I it it really seals in there, and the bass sounds so much better than these bows. And I paid three hundred dollars for these bows, uh, and Everybody says, well, the bows aren't really super high fidelity. Well, they're mainly for... The noise canceling is so strong on there that it almost messes with the audio quality, in my opinion. I've tried the bows before, and they're yeah. great at making the world just disappear around you. But they do such a good job that they feel like they're kind of making the music or audio you're listening to <laughs> disappear as well. And, and I probably should have half a dozen different pair of headphones like you do uh, so that I could really try. But long story short, uh, right now on Kickstarter, you can get these for 65 bucks. They are going to come out with two new pair if they can get this funded that are going to be like $200 and $300. And I don't even know why they're going to be that much better. 
uh, but I'm curious to see how it goes. Uh, there, it's an interesting product if you're if you're willing to go to Kickstarter to try something out. Uh, the the chip that's in here, the Bluetooth chip that I have in here, does not let me go any distance. But that's because this was a prototype that didn't have the chip that they're now putting in there. Ah, uh, so, what are they doing for power in this guy? Is it uh, is it just in the dongle? Yeah, there's a little battery in there. There's a USB micro USB connector that you can do charge them with. Um, mm -hmm. it's supposed to last ten hours. Uh, I haven't tried to calculate exactly how long they last, but you get a full day in. Yeah, uh, ten hours. I don't. I I used to use these Motorola uh, over ear headphones uh, for work and when I'm running around doing stuff and they were supposed to last 10 hours and they were very uh, petite and I would end up having to carry two pairs of them with me oh. one for half of the day and one for the other half of the day because oh. the 10 hours is like casual use yeah but if you you know if I'm setting up for something or I'm packing for an event or doing something like that I am basically headphones and working and right. I am listening 100% of the time throughout the day and so that 10 hours is really more like six five and a half and yeah. then over time those batteries start to keel over so uh that's actually where i move to these more expensive ones is this is 20 i get 25 hours out of these wow. so i can go an entire international flight to uh, uh where's yeah. the longest plate probably australia is my worst and <laughs> you can fly all the way to australia and not run out of battery juice nice. on these guys so uh, well, we're checking out. I am not a fan of the Bose uh, noise canceling headphones at all, and I don't know if it's just me personally, but uh, that noise canceling is so strong on the Bose that it actually makes me feel like I'm stuffy, like I almost like I have a head cold. Uh, mm -hmm. The Sennheiser Momentus do not cancel nearly as well as the Bose, but they do a good job without giving me that feeling of being underwater. So. Yeah. That's my personal preference. Uh, these are about the same price. I think you can get these. I've got a link in the show notes. That they're 270 265 on Amazon warehouse deals right now. So really decent headphones, and they're versatile because you can go from plugged, unplugged, noise canceling, no noise canceling, uh, Bluetooth to no Bluetooth, You know, however you want to use them. Really cool. wonderful. Yeah. All right, moving on to not-so-wonderful products. Let's talk about the next line of action cameras because we needed yet another action camera in our <laughs> life. Now, this is sort of leaked image actually of the new Olympus TG tracker action cam. Uh, they have had one with a similar name in the past. This one will have a few new features including full motion detection and GPS inside of the unit. It has a flip out screen. It is capable of lighting its own stuff because it has a 20 and 60 luminance light above the lens, uh, 200 degree viewing angle. And basically that's about it. No word on pricing yet, but Mitch, as we see all of these GoPro style cameras, action cameras, so to speak, and lifestyle cameras come out, is there any feature that they could possibly add to any of these that would make them attractive enough to actually buy? Because uh, <laughs> if you're not an extreme sports person, you, you, the waterproofing is whatever and the, the beating it up is whatever. So what else can they do to make you want one of these? Uh, nothing. nothing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, it totally depends upon what your needs are. I had a conversation yesterday about gopro cameras with a friend of mine um like why why does anybody buy a gopro these days there are so many different action cameras out there if you're going to do an action camera what is what is the appealing uh value for uh, specifically for gopro other than they've got a brand name right i mean if you look at the the specs on this thing waterproof to 30 meters um 4K shooting, okay. uh, built-in light, flip-out screen. Uh, Load bearing it, to 100 kilograms. I'm like, what? So yeah, you can't crush it. You you can throw it in the pool. You can go down to the bottom of the ocean. Um, I mean, it, it is, as far as cameras go, if this were out at the same time as the original uh, GoPro Black Hero 4 whatever edition, uh, 
I probably would have gone with something like this over the the GoPro. For me, I still kept my my four black edition because it's tiny right. and occasional. That's pretty much it for me. Tiny. The size is what does it. Uh, yeah. A tiny, tiny camera that I can fit into a, a space that I can't fit any other camera into. And I was actually hoping that was what my E1Z cam would do for right. me. And right. it does not quite accomplish. Uh, and it's rec controllable by your phone. But now every single action cam has that capability and people don't have any sort of loyalty to one action cam over the other. They just want all the features and they want the lowest price. And now there are uh, Chinese knockoffs of GoPros out there that are in the like $60 range. And how do you maintain a $499 uh, price when you can buy something with very, very similar specs for a hundred dollars or a hundred and fifty dollars. Well, what is the price on this? I don't see it in this list. Yeah, there's no price on this this one yet. This is actually leaked images of their new action cam. And Olympus is such a weird company that I, I don't know. I, I, when I found out they did an action cam, I'm like, of course you did Olympus. Of course you did. <laughs> well, why not? Why wouldn't you? I mean, next thing you know, a smartphone will come out. Good job. You know what? <laughs> Nice. I got to I, I love, okay, so I have a love-hate relationship with Olympus. I love their lenses. They make some really great lenses, but their camera bodies, I mean, they look really awesome. Like when you see an Olympus body, you're like, oh, that is so retro. That looks great. But I mean, retro does not a camera make. And right. they skimp out on like all, all kinds of weird stuff, you know. Uh, every other camera in the micro four-thirds market is offering 4K. They're like, ah, eh, we don't need that. The, they're like, oh, well. We're going to add video, but the video is going to be really iffy. Oh, we'll have really great image stabilization, but because our video is so iffy, it's really kind of not really worth it. And then you go into the menu systems, you go into some of the other things, and it's like for photography, they do really good. But I, I don't know who's going to go shoot pro on an Olympus body and lens. I'm saying that knowing that I'm going to get some really mean emails about <laughs> that statement. So... I'm not dogging on Olympus. I own tons of Olympus lenses. It's just, what are you doing, Olympus? I know they had some scandals in the company, and somebody embezzled a bunch of money, and a bunch of uh, other weird things have happened. In fact, did you read that news article about uh, the promoter for Olympus stealing all of the promotional items that he was supposed to be uh, giving away and then selling them on the black market for a uh, profit of like $360,000? Wow, nice. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm I'm done bashing on Olympus. Great, uh, this camera I, action camera this, is. This is exciting to me. This camera, by the way, uh, it does continuous recording time of 29 minutes. Huh? Does it? Is there is there a doesn't GoPro go for like until the card fills up? Yeah, or the battery runs out. So about an hour. So why, so why is there a limit? Uh, oh wait, there's a taxation issue. European tax. Uh, Although, it, go ahead. No, that doesn't actually apply to everybody. Um, some companies have just uh, said whatever and done it anyway, and no yeah. one's been fined. So exactly. it's really sort of this gray area. Exactly. Uh, and and oh, by the way, the headlights—they call it headlights. I want to say lice. Headlights. Uh, <laughs> for the sixty lumens, did you read this? It'll operate for a whopping sixty seconds. Really. One minute at 60 lumens and 29 minutes at 20 lumens. Why even have the 60? That's that's well, here, doesn't make any under, maybe you're underwater and you need a really bright light for 30 seconds to 60 seconds to film the fish. Then you know, hmm. that seems I'm sorry, I'm making fun of. And the other thing that I really really like about this is the color green that they have on it. It's, <laughs> that's, that's a green. that is a lovely color green. Would you look at that, folks? Uh, that's like very it. green. <sighs> yeah, action cams. I, I'm sorry, guys. I do still have my GoPro. I still use it. I I am not complaining. It's just that nothing has really advanced in the last what two years as far as action cams go. Uh, every single one is basically uh, racing to the bottom of the barrel. Sony, Olympus, now. Uh, Kodak of all companies have all been pretty much releasing clones of each other. Even I think the remember the GPS company Garmin. Yeah, they've got an action cam. <laughs> you know the Garmin Noeva or Novi or it's like oh. what you you know you 
you're trying to branch out. I understand that the GPS market is kind of dying because of cell phones, but uh, is uh, jumping on another sinking ship the right way to go, buddy? I don't <laughs> think so. <sighs> All right. Speaking of sinking ships, one last thing I wanted to uh, drop in there, and this is actually a positive note to end the show on. Uh, if you remember in the old days, way back in 2007, there used to be a uh, show called Indie Mogul. And uh, for any no-budget filmmakers, this is something you're probably familiar with. They were responsible for making a little short video showing you how to do different blood effects, uh, face effects, making practical effects, doing just weird random stuff that's kind of cool and interesting and gave a lot of people good ideas for what to do with their no-budget films. Now, that show has been off the air for I think over two years now, maybe a year and a half, but they're bringing the original host back, Eric, and we'll be starting new shows very, very soon. I think in, uh, in June is when they start doing that. So if you are interested in checking out Indie Mogul, uh, swing over to their Twitter page. Uh, it's just Indie Mogul, at Indie Mogul, and you can uh, find out more about their new shows coming out on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's interesting that uh, they're coming back in, and I'm actually... You know, I I like to watch those sometimes. They're fun. They got a puppet in it. You know, puppets are great. Mitch, <laughs> did you ever watch uh, Indie Mogul at all? I I know I I know absolutely nothing about Indie Mogul. Uh, well, if you ever want to know how to make blood shoot out of a knife, or uh, build yeah. a cardboard robot, or uh, I have a question for you, DJ. Why in the world would you promote somebody else's program? Because I like good stuff. And I am not one of those jerks who only promotes his own thing. If someone's got something good and I think you guys will enjoy it, I will put it in the show notes. And sure, there are affiliate links you'll find in the show notes, but there are also just links in the show notes to things that I what? think are really cool. I know, right? What? I'm not getting paid for this? No joke. No joke, guys. Uh, this service is free of gratis to you as Mitch and I do this on our spare time which is very limited many days what, you're not getting uh, paid for this no i'm not but i was thinking about possibly starting a patreon account for the show if uh, any of you guys would be interested in you know throwing a, a few cents at every episode uh, that would be extremely awesome um we might do something like that or or whatnot in the future we try to keep the show uh, fairly low on ads uh but uh if huh. we uh, you know, have there been any <laughs> No, I don't think they're having. Well, so, that's pretty low, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we keep the, the show free of ads, actually. So there you go. Uh, so we're just looking at possible ways to uh, make it a little bit more uh, worth our time to continue doing the show. And this is not us saying we're going to cancel or anything like that. It's simply, uh, it is our free time, guys. So when you get really harsh in the comments section, just remember <laughs> that uh, I am just one dude out there in the world and Mitch is just one guy and we're just trying to talk about the things that we love. Uh, one final note before we go, uh, a correction from last week's episode and a number uh -oh. of you emailed me and uh, uh, that's where I was referring to the, the nastiness. Um, I mentioned that the GTX 1080 had HBM memory. That is incorrect. I accidentally opened up the rumors page instead of the news report page, and they were rumored to have HBM memory, which was available in the uh, R9390X series of AMD graphics cards, but they're actually using GDR5 in the GTX 1080, and we won't see HBM memory probably until the Titan series is refreshed from NVIDIA. So sorry about that mistake. Uh, that's my fault, grabbing the wrong news article when I was skimming through the information. So there's your correction. So, so your Airhead co-host, Planet Mitch, says, huh? what? <laughs> I'm, um, uh, the difference between uh, GDDR and HBM, uh, HBM is basically on chip. They fuse the memory uh, with the chip. And by doing so, the bandwidth and the latency is – you have all the bandwidth and you have almost none of the latency. Uh, with GDR5, you do have extremely fast memory, but it is off-chip and has to be accessed via a bus. And the bus limits the speed and bandwidth availability 
to the processor for access to the memory. And so as you're storing video frames, doing calculations and so on, uh, that bandwidth determines how fast the CPU and, or GPU actually would probably be the proper term inside of your graphics card can get stuff from the memory. <laughs> no, dead silence, okay. <laughs> You got me there, yeah. Mitch. You got me there. <laughs> On that note, guys, uh, Mitch, you have anything else before we get out of here? Hey, uh, I do really want to encourage people, not just because um, I do get an affiliate commission if you guys use that planet5d.com slash bundle link. If you, if you want to skip that altogether and just go to 5daydeal.com and not pay me an affiliate commission, get this bundle. There is so much good stuff in it. I really seriously just look at it, have a look, take five minutes to see all the stuff that's in there. And if you're not impressed, that's fine. Skip it. But don't miss it if you're at all interested in getting any kind of filmmaking training. This stuff is, I mean, there's $3,000 worth of products in here. For well, and how many hours worth of video training is in that? That looks like a very substantial watch, like 24 or more hours worth of video. Please. Yes. I mean, there, there is stuff. I mean, the Shane Hurlbut stuff, he's got a two-hour video where he goes through some of the films that he has shot. Ugh, I bit my tongue, sorry. <laughs> like Need for Speed and some of, the, some of the films that he has done and shows you why he lit the scene certain ways. I mean, how, where do you get two hours of a Hollywood director of photography taking film bits and dissecting them and telling you why he lit something a specific way, what emotions he was trying to get. You know, I mean, that's worth it for 97 bucks all by itself. I mean, there is just so much stuff in here. It's incredible. Check it out. Go to 5daydeal.com or planet5d.com slash bundle if you want to help me out a little bit. Either way, go check it out. Don't, don't miss this bundle if you can. As always, guys, you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and anywhere podcasts are distributed. Swing over to DSLRFilmNoob.com for coverage of anything that I'm writing about, as well as the YouTube channel, as always. And make sure you write, subscribe, uh, link to this on your Twitter account. Just tell us what you think about the shows. We always love input from you guys. Even the negative input is okay. Um, no. Mitch, people can sure. find you where? Dot com. And thanks, guys, for listening and for watching. And we'll see you next time on another episode of DSLR Film Noob Manufacturing Podcast. <laughs> yeah, I always forget people don't know about all those different manufacturing options that are out there. It, if you are a independent developer or someone who wants to be their own man as, a, as an entrepreneur, the world is your oyster these days, where in the old days you would have to, you know, find a friend, a company, or build your own stuff. Now you can create from anything. It's amazing. It is very true. I mean, and if you ever wanted to start a business, now is the time to do it. I mean, hey, don't you have a site about uh, business? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, that's that's very true. It's called Smart Business Planet. Uh, however, I have not been doing anything with that because I have a, a totally different uh, thing going on in it that has to do with doing giveaways, but that's a whole nother topic. Uh, giveaways dun, dun, dun. are very popular, and uh, I can talk to you about that offline, DJ, but giveaways are awesome. They're great. It, it has to do with advertising, right? Part of the problem right now is that people on the internet are becoming ad blind. So banner ad blind. So if you go to Planet yeah. 5D, we have banner ads on the side. And bless your heart for those of you who do click those. Uh, I, I found that 20% of the people are using ad blockers, which is... 20%? No, oh, that's, that's pretty substantial. For, for a website that's, that's free and funded because of those ads, it gets rather irritating when people are, you, you know, just turning them off altogether. I mean, it's... You know, you're going to get me on a rant here. Oh, no. I, I'm lucky in that uh, DSLRFilmNoob.com is not a super profitable uh, endeavor on my part. But uh, It's not my living like uh, Mitch, but uh, it's 
revenue is strictly derived almost, I would say, 90% from click-throughs uh, in the articles themselves, no banner ads uh, at all. And there are a few banner ads on the site, but most of those, they're not really there for profit. They're just there because it's stuff I like and I throw up there at random as I see it. It's So I am in a completely different boat than you and uh, many other people who rely heavily on banner ads and, and pop-ups and some of these other things. Yeah, and, and it slays me, the hate mail that I get sometimes. People say, you know, your, your site's so full of advertising. And if I take a minute and use one of my keyboard shortcuts <laughs> to send them an email that basically explains to them why I do this, most people really don't think about it. And I can understand that, you know, there's, there's the corporate mentality. Like if you look at Engadget or something, you think, well, they're, you know, they're, they're purely doing that in order to make money and profit and, you know, whatever. But they don't think about necessarily a website like Planet 5D as being my only source of income. And, and once I explain to them that, you know, those ads mean money to me and my family and what they eat and how they go to college and all that other stuff, then they're kind of like, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have said that or maybe I shouldn't be blocking ads on your website. I've had people turn their ad blocker off specifically for Planet 5D because – I've explained to them why those are there. I mean, they just don't think about what the ramifications are. And so, uh, you know, I get a little irritated when people write me nasty things and say... Think of uh, Planet 5D as your mom and pa coffee shop down the street. Do yeah. you walk past that to go to the Starbucks and give your money to the corporation? Or do you kindly show up to Mitch's front door and get a cup of steaming hot Planet 5D in your cup? Yeah. And, and, and I certainly appreciate each and every reader. And like you said, if they write me something and slam me, I, I've got, I'm not perfect. I need to learn stuff. I mean, I, I've put ads up or banner ads or pop-ups and, and they're flat out stupid. And I learned a lesson and I don't do those again. But you have to try things, right? Like anything, you got to learn. So anyway. Absolutely. Um, That's getting deep into the weeds here, guys. So, uh. <laughs> On that note, I've got some women's in trade footage to take up and edit. I've got three uh, videos. Did you know there's a Iron Workers Guild for uh, women's in trade? I, I didn't know that. I, no. I mean, until I got involved with this project, um, they even had a fashion show. And <laughs> I don't want to comment on the fashion show bit, but it, um, it was interesting because they would have – uh, a lady in each of the different fields. They had uh, welders, iron workers. They had um, linemen. They had uh, some uh, very uh, uh, various crafts, and each one of them would be dressed in their their work attire, and then they would explain how much each of the jobs paid. And some of those, I mean, man, a uh, uh, lineman that was like uh, eighty or ninety thousand dollars a year. So it's uh, it's. You know, it's eye opening to find out, you know, what an iron worker or a plumber or a electrician makes. That's uh, interesting to know. So, uh, and it's really good too. They had uh, um, a lot of younger people there seeing that, and it gets them to think about going to a trade school or going through a craft as opposed to being an office worker because, right. you know, everybody wants to go to college and get a bachelor's degree and uh, be a, you know, a computer programmer or something like that. But right. if everybody's a computer programmer, who builds the houses? Who fixes your stuff? Who, you know, constructs things? Who keeps the lights on? Uh, we need more of those people too. So, yep. uh I, if you don't want to be a filmmaker, guys, uh, look at a craft too. There's a lot of crafts out there, and uh, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> but okay. it was fun. It was really interesting. All right, I'm gonna kill the end of show because we are just getting weird here. Uh, you guys, thanks for sticking around this long. If you've made it the last 15 minutes past the end of the show, Mitch, thanks as always for coming out. It's always great talking to you, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.